We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. I wanted to take a quick minute to talk about our, one of our sponsors that make this podcast possible, and that's Parker Sporlin and the Catch-All Filter Dryer. Do you know what can reduce system efficiencies and reliability within your refrigeration system? If you answer contamination, you are correct. Sporlin catch-all dryers have been around, been around since 1947 and have been perfected over the years to capture water, acid, solids, debris, including sludges and varnishes. For best practices, change the catch-all filter dryer if any of the following occurs. Initial system install, when a system is open for service or repair, when excessive pressure drop of 5 PSI across the filter dryer, when the see all sight glass indicates water is present, when doing a T1 1 acid test kit says there's acid present, during a compressor burnout cleanup, and following a successful burnout cleanup. To find out more information, by downloading Bulletin 40 10 from sporlin.com with all the catch all filter dryer information. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. This uplifting cinematic experience. Uh, I've got something important to tell you, man. The big story is... Dig this and dig it. Deep. Hey, it's good effort. Way to go. Way to go. Dude, don't encourage him. Last host know I'm being sarcastic, right? <laughs> I've been called the songbird of my generation. Holy shit. I'm holding in a huge kiss. So could you get to the point? Terrible. Awful. I hated it. War's over, man. Wormer dropped a big one. Bloody suck. I never thought I'd see the day when two such highly reputable mischief makers as yourselves douse your drawers at the side of a mall security guard. I see you got fat. The force is strong with this one. What are you, eight? Hello, everybody.
everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. What's going on this week, man? Oh, I'm doing some basically remote programming. Realized how much I hate sitting in an office all day and uh, would rather jump out of a building at this point. Is it really that bad? I just can't stand sitting in an office. AKA my house, but yeah, I, I I can't do it. Are your kids off school? Uh, today was their last day. Okay. I mean, so then I really won't be able to do it. Yeah, you can. Just have them up on the roof. Not when there's five of them here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, sounds like someone's going to be using their wireless thing for doing the remote programming for a little bit, aren't they? No, I'll just go on site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that and then OGP startups. Yeah, how's that going? Uh, I absolutely hate it. And you know why? Because it's the same issue over and over and over again. It's like it's like being stuck in a wheel of like never ending bullshit that you're just like, you know what? It's fucked. So bigger is better. <laughs> so it's it's funny. So I, I actually after after we recorded that podcast, I, I was talking to another customer of ours, and you know, they basically had the same issue, except for you know, we we had a conference call about it, and was like, yeah, it was like, oh yeah, we could do you know tandem compressors, you could do digital control or the hot gas bypass, and and so we we went down to meet with them, and you know, he was talking about yeah. Uh, crack and you know Husman, they actually have a kit for you know that they can size for the hot gas bypass valve desuperheating. And I was like, can I get that part number for a go, just to make sure? Yeah, get that kit so you can send it right back to that to that OEM. <laughs> this needed yeah, to be put in. There's a kit for a reason because uh, that's called an engineering boo boo. Yeah, I mean, it, but, it doesn't. Right. And, and it would be easy to fix because all you'd have to do is like just mount a, a CT onto the one of the compressor legs, and basically whenever the compressor pulls amperage and it activates those solenoids, no harm, no foul. Cool. But then an engineer would have to admit they were wrong, and that's uh, easier said than done. Like my wife admitting she's wrong. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would probably get a better response out of my wife admitting she's wrong than an engineer admitting they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't say anything. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always wrong, apparently. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, whatever. All right, so guys, we're going to go over uh, kind of planning and executing EMS changeovers, kind of something that I end up doing a lot. And here lately, it's been a lot of my uh, time spent doing this. So Guys, when I'm when I'm going to do an EMS changeover, like the biggest part, like mostly I'm doing the quoting. If you're not doing the quoting of it, it's going to be kind of hard to do. So, biggest thing, like when I'm doing these changeovers, is site walks. Like I I refuse to do them off a of pop sheet remotely. So what do you mean? Of- why? Whoa, 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 whoa! Why? Those sheets are extremely accurate and always yeah, they're right. extremely accurate and. Uh, you end up getting a stick shut of your ass every time you show up to go do a job like that. So I refuse to do anything off a pop sheet. So my whole thing here is I want to walk the site. Whoever is doing the job should be the one walking the site, <clears throat> not your project manager, not somebody else. If you're going to, if you're a project manager and you're, and you're doing these, you need to walk it with your lead guy. That's going to be running it because otherwise if he doesn't put his input in here and how you're going to pull this job off, it's going to be a disaster. There's going to be arguments. You're going to lose money. You're going to lose product. It's all proper planning. And uh, that's where this whole thing re- lies out. So let's take an example. So like when I'm walking a rack. So what I do generally, I, I'm still kind of working on this. I use a thing called Side Out at Pro. And I will take pictures of everything. And I'll like write, I can write notes next to the pictures. I do it for all my commissioning stuff. I use the same software. Like I'll take pictures of the racks and I'll write down some measurements in there and then of what I have. And then whatever OEM I'm using, whether it be Emerson, Microthermal, I have never done RDM. Really wish they would send me some stuff to 
too, but um, it, hey, Chris, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tice. <laughs> um, so it also, yeah, it, but it also depends, uh, like you know what you're what you're going from what to what, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, if I'm going to Dan Foss and if you're going from anything from control, like you're going to have a bad time, no matter what. I mean, you're pretty much going to have a bad time because the boards are all vertical. Whoa. You're going to, tight, you're going to be tight on space. Could you still hear me talking? Yeah. I hate you. <laughs> hey, listen, if you guys are going from like control through anything, guys, you're going to have a bad time. Plain and simple. You're going to, because the boards are vertical and whatever you're going in there, is generally not going to fit. So a lot more prep work is going to have to go in there and checkups, measuring, you know, whatever it is. If you're doing whatever control you're putting in there, you need to come in there with the dimensions of the boards you're going to need. If you know you're going to need RO boards, okay, have the dimensions for that. If you know that this board is going to be mounted on on a uh, DIN rail train, you know, just, you know, lay that out, how it's going to be laid out in there. Like I walk in there, like if I know I'm doing microthermal ones and the 700 boards are say four and a half uh, tall and six and a half wide, you know, I'll figure out how many boards I need. I'll measure it out, make sure it'll fit. Because here's the thing, we, we run into all these situations where, yeah, we're a quarter inch short. Okay, well, yeah, I can push it all the way up against the top, but now I can't get the input there, the outputs in, in and out. So like planning like that, Okay, do I have to move this to the rack door, which I've been do- doing quite a lot here lately. I'm not a big fan of doing it, but it's better than adding a panel. See, I, I, so, would, I, would, do, I would do inputs. I would, you know, obviously you're just talking inputs only, yeah? No, I've, I've had to do outputs too, but I do it in a way that is non-hackish. Like I wrap them, I wrap them in the plastic wrap like, like, like the OEM would. Yeah. And then... I do not splice anything, not an input, not an output, with any wire nuts, gel caps, anything. Everything, if I have to extend it, goes on a terminal block. And I've been religious about it, and it's it's made everything a lot easier because yeah. now when we do these, say if I do have to move a board train to a door, like if I had to put boards on a door, I can pre-run all the wires. And pre-mark everything. That way, when I do do the switchover, I'm just moving things to the terminal block one by one. Super easy. And it looks clean. So one question I had for you, because I've actually never quoted an EMS chat. Well, no, okay, I have. But, like, I'm I'm overboard, so I'd I'd rather be like, oh, well, it's, you know, to not exceed, you know, this. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm just, I, I haven't done it enough to try to quote one together, but like, you know, how do you, how do you personally try to figure out basically how long, how long it's going to take you to run X com wire? I mean, I know, you know, if there, depending on how many straights there are, how many nineties there are, if you got to go through the floor or whatever. Um, like if you had to run a new com line from the front of the store to the back of the store and had to stop off at like three places and it's 400. Oh, it really depends on, on where it's at, how if it's like a big box store and I could fly through the ceiling and we're all yeah. good, or if it's like a Sam's and it's got to be in conduit, I let my electricians do it. Like they have a, they have a number they use for putting up conduit and uh, pulling wire. But generally like I'll break wire poles down. Like a uh, pole will be like, I could probably do eight wires and, every four hours for two guys, like I'll, I'll break it down kind of like that. It all depends on a site by site basis. But when you start adding sensors to stuff and you got to break down cases that are already there, do you talk a lot of time? Like um, the last job I had, I had 32 hours for a carpenter just to take kick plates off for us. Damn. Like just to be there. I mean, because I mean, they were all single deck islands. Like it was a lot of work. Like he, the, he was legitimately there for 32 hours pulling apart cases. I mean, we had that much just fish and wire around cases. So, I mean, that, that part gets sketchy. I'm still kind of on the fence about that stuff. I'm still kind of learning, like, the sensor poles type stuff. I usually fish that out to the electricians. I try not to have my pipe fitters pulling wire because the electricians cost less than us. If we're slow, well, my guys are pulling wire. 
Well, that and, you know, there, there is a difference between running, just running wire and running low voltage wire. You have to be extremely careful with the way that you're pulling. Like I, I remember one job uh, when I was up in New York and uh, basically we, what did we do? Um, I had, had the, the two wire dollies that you get from Home Depot. It's basically two pieces of uh, fiberglass um, or plastic, whatever they're made of. And, and I had probably 12, 12 spools on the damn thing at, the, at, the, at once. Because if I'm pulling to one case and it's going, you know, all the frozen food, I have EPRs getting pulled. I have, you know, uh, uh, defrost termination, you know, everything I would need. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm as lazy as that. I won't. I'll pull as much wire as I have to, so it you know uh, doesn't have if, to take if me forever. Doing, if there's that much, I'm having electricians do it. They're 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 better at it, mm-hmm. and my time's better. Not to sound like a dick, but my time's better spent doing other things. When I could have electricians pull wire all day long, and I could have me or my guys, you know, terminate everything. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it's better that better to have them do it, and it's more. They, let's just be honest. They, that's their trade. They, 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 they're good at it. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes them less time to put, throw up conduit than it's going to take one of my fitters to throw up conduit or me to throw up conduit. Like that's their trade. So if I get that much, I'm going to have them do it. I mean, I'll run them and we'll, we'll manage your material. We'll manage your, them, but I mean, we'll, we'll have them pull everything. Now, when it becomes like the changeover stuff, like I'm doing all the quoting for that. Like here lately, I've been doing all the quoting for us. So like, I'll, I'll walk a site. I'll right away in a rack. I will count the number of inputs and outputs that I see. I do this two ways. And I always do this to verify. I count the number of physical inputs and outputs that I are physically in the rack in a condenser that I, I find. And then I compare that number to the controller to make sure that I don't have hidden boards somewhere in a panel. I don't have remote boards somewhere that get missed. I always do this. It doesn't matter what control system it is. I religiously do this because I've gotten burned on remote panels in like places. Like we have some like old school stores out here. They have like six, seven remote panels and like there's remote panels everywhere. And I mean, a, a couple of missed boards could really, you know, screw your day up. could really screw your day up and it could screw your job margins up. So, what I do is I get a, a solid count on the number of inputs and outputs. Okay. Then I will lay the rack panel out on a piece of paper, measurements of everywhere I got, and I'll see, okay, can I ditch this, this cable tray up here to make more room? Do I need to remove these boards over the side? I'll lay it out on a piece of paper of how I think it's going to work, you know, with the measurements, all the boards, how long they're going to be, um, what board is going to go where? Because it really depends. I mean, if you do a microthermal, this is where microthermal is kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, you can only have certain inputs and outputs on certain board trains. So you have to really pay attention when you're doing a microthermal swap from CPC to microthermal. Like you have to really pay attention because you have to route your inputs and outputs. I mean, if you run out of space, which the last five stores I've done, I ran out of space. I'm 16 inputs short. So they got to go on a different board. So it affects the way everything works. So like just planning out inputs and outputs where they got to go. I mean, I may take an entire day to do an EMS walk slash changeover for one store. Yeah, people don't like that because it's a lot of cost up front. But I'll tell you right now, I'm not the last like 10 jobs I've done have done great because we did our homework in the beginning and yeah, I'm a little bit more, but at the end of the day, like everything's going to be done properly. And I spent a lot more time on cosmetics. So question, if you were to, I mean, you know how, how long a, a module or a board is on, on control, right? And like how, how big the cabinets, the remote cabinets typically are. Will you forego a comp, like if you're doing a Danfoss swap, um, would you forego another comm module versus having to remount a larger enclosure? Yeah. I, I don't want, I, I hate adding enclosures to racks. It looks like shit, but it's, it, it, let's just be honest. Like enclosures are expensive. Talking about like, you know, like if you're doing a, a control swap out and you have to put in, you know, Danfoss boards, 
and you know you're you're limited to how long the boards can be based off the enclosure now would you like i said just stack one or two you know add two more com modules to take up the rest of that space or are you you actually installing a whole new mod or uh, um, panel there i'm adding more modules okay i mean i would too it just it makes more sense it's actually you know more cost effective to do it anyway yeah, I mean, I've only done a couple of Dan Foss conversions. They were some of the first I did. And I'm going to lie, I lost my ass and I completely screwed them up. But I had no I had no direction, no help. I mean, and it was the 800 series controller, the original one that made you want to slam your dick in a car door. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so like when I'm doing like CPC or cake to do, like the, the changeovers are butter. Because mm-hmm. the program is a lot easier, it's open, anything can go anywhere. So, like with Emerson stuff, it's a lot easier to do your your uh, overlays. So, just like picking, not overlays, your your replacements, just picking out your spots and your boards, and getting a list of boards, list of material, list of all your inputs and outputs, extra material you're going to need. Always order a few boards extra. Like I don't care what I'm doing. I will always have a few boards extra, input boards, output boards, comm modules, uh, spare transformers. As you're doing a bunch of these, I build up a kit. So, like, we have an extra spare thing of microthermal boards. So like, okay, if I go to a store and I'm 1722F short or 1722F won't, won't communicate or it's having problems, all right, well, we already got another one. I don't have to wait for a warranty board. I don't. It's not going to slow the job down. It's going to stop the job. We have extra parts. Or, like, the save your ass parts is, like, Oh shit! We missed this panel, and uh, <laughs> over here, well, we boards. It's not going to affect the job, you know. It's just going to get made up on the next job. Yeah, so for sure. So having those save your ass parts, and then here lately, all of my outputs. We just started doing this. We're using uh, these square crimp crimp connectors. I think they're called ferrules. So what? Amazon has them. Wago. Like I. No, they're ferrules. Like it's a square, it makes a square crimp. So it's like you ever seen how Hill Phoenix connects like two two wires together yes, inside of like it's, a it's clear, it's clear, and then it has like the yellow, the blue, and the red on it. That yes. So okay. I use these crimp connectors on everything now. I love them. They look so much nicer. So what we do is uh when we're when we're moving wires, we pull them off the, the strand of wires, we'll strip them back a little more, we'll put the crimp connector in there, we'll crimp them. And we use those to land in the outputs. It looks way cleaner. They are a lot easier to label then because you can pull them apart. You can put two wires or three wires into an output without having to shove the wires in there and the strands all be on the sides. You just put these uh, square crimp connectors in there. They're cheap. I mean, we can do a whole job with one box usually. Um, I've been using those on everything. I tend not to use them on the inputs because it's hard to get a good on them. But I will use them on like microthermal. You have to double up all the grounds. Like all the grounds go to like two spots on the boards. So you may have, you could have up to, you know, four or five wires going in one ground. So I will use the crimp connectors on the grounds and it makes it a lot easier to manage the wire and look a lot cleaner. And then I, was, I will order like, f- go ahead. When I was up, when I was up in uh, Connecticut before I left, you know, when I thought I was just going to continue to do EMS all the time. Uh, I was going to invest in that. I forget what the damn tool is, but uh, you've seen them on a lot of the newer case connections where it's, you know, they take a 14 gauge wire and basically it's able to, you know, go down to a very, very small terminal strip. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I was going to actually invest and buy buy that tool if I did a bunch of EMS. I didn't know if you, you had one of those already. No. And then the other thing I do, like I buy bulk like terminal blocks. So, mm-hmm. and I found like Amazon is the best place to get terminal blocks. Like I will buy 100, uh, 150 pack counts of terminal blocks, then 35 mm-hmm. millimeter dead rail terminal mm-hmm. blocks. I'll have an entire pack out full of them of red, blue, black, orange, uh, green, all these pack outs, uh, terminal blocks, this pack out. And that's how I'm doing my splices. Mm-hmm. And I will use that to clean it up because if I don't have room and I got a remote mount boards, I don't want to use wire nuts. I don't use crimps. It looks like shit. And I mean, let's be honest, a rack vibrates a lot. You're just opening yourself up to issues later on. 
I use no wire nuts on the entire job. I don't want to see a wire nut in a rack. I don't let any of my guys use wire nuts. I don't want to even see them. The only thing we'll, we will use is the cri- the clear crimp connectors that uh, the, the OEMs use. That is the only thing I use for connected wires and compressors and stuff like that. Um, everything else gets spliced in terminal blocks. Hmm. Hello, guys. This episode is brought to you by Field Peace. Field Peace's next generation of vacuum pumps will cut down on evacuation time and make oil changes on the fly a breeze. They are lightweight, durable, and feature four inline ports plus a large oil reservoir. Get pumped about these three new Field Peace vacuum pumps available at distributors now. Learn more at fieldpeace.com or follow us on social media at Field Peace Products. Thanks again and thanks for listening. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats, these floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency, and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. It probably saves you a bunch of time when you're having to relocate all the stuff for the outputs, right? Tons of time because like, so the last job we did, I had to remote, I had to put a remote board train for a suction group on, on the door, it would not fit. So I mounted on the door. We actually pre-ran all the uh, outputs over. So we pre-ran all the wires for the outputs, the inputs all reached. We pre-ran all the outputs over. So when we, we did the switch over, it literally took me folding wires over two inches, crimp them into the terminal box, crimp them into the terminal blocks. And it was just one by one. So it just literally went, I the way I laid, laid it out, so it went, all the CPC inputs or outputs, it didn't matter what was normally open, normally closed, because it was already wired on the on the boards itself. I just literally had to stab them in the terminal blocks and tighten them down. So the switchover, you know, we, we did a lot of prep work in the beginning, you know, maybe like four or five hours of prep work. But when we did the actual switchover, we were done in an hour and 10 minutes with the uh-huh. actual like and circuits because when we did all our, our homework in the beginning and we all we did had to do was stab wires in. And it must be really good and, and, and actually makes it easier to do the interlocks, right? And if no one knows what I'm talking about, th- thinking about a good uh, refrigeration circuit on a defrost clock. Your defrost clock has one normally open set of contacts and one normally closed. And basically when you're hooking up to, you know, one and two on the same, you know, same common, you're basically switching that over. Um, some of these systems, you know, usually they put in an interlock, which is, a way for the refrigeration solenoid not to be on at the same time as your, you know, defrost solenoid. Then that way there's no way physically you could do that. And some, a lot of times you have to double up on some of the wires in order to run that common over. Yeah. But if you do your, your homework and you get it all done in the beginning, all you got to do, like if you have to pre-run stuff from a different panel and you're intersecting at a terminal block, it's stab, stab wires in the terminal block and that's it. So everything's done before. So what I tend to do is all my prep work at the beginning. First day I get on site, I'm unboxing everything. I get a table. I lay everything out nice, get a, get a board count, get a sensor count, compare it to what was ordered, make sure every, we have enough boards for everything, double check all that. We'll re-pull our comm line if we have to pull a comm line. So if it's microthermal and we got to pull a new comm line, we re-pull that first thing, knock it out, get it done in the machine room set up the terminal. If it's CPC, I'll look and see if I'm pulling a comm line. If it's Dan Foss, I generally always re-pull a comm line in the machine room because here's what I do. I will start it and 
I will pre-mount all the boards. I will take down the old boards, fold them over. I'll put them on, uh, if it's control, it's an absolute bitch because, you know, damn well, those, as soon as you touch those, those cages, like these boards just start exploding. So what works real good is the foam, the Emerson boards come in, that, or that pink foam. That works real good to wrap boards in. Cardboard. Cardboard. I'll use that. Emerson kicks ass because what you do, especially if you have multi-flex boards, you pull the board down. I leave the rack running while I'm doing this. I'm just very careful, and I blow myself up enough to, you know, know my abilities. Um, I will take the board. Loose. Stop it! Don't don't angle. don't don't I'm, patronize me like you've done on that. I'm I'm um, dying inside right now. Unbelievable! You're getting too corporate. For that. <laughs> um. So I'll, I'll 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 hang the boards loose and then I'll take this uh, the the backing plates off. I'll slam the backing plates on and then you're good to go. I just leave them hang. I don't wrap them in anything. I'll generally I may hang them inside the rack or zip tie them up a little bit. I will mount all the new boards. I will get everything level. Mount all the new boards. I will mount the new transformer for the boards. Or if I'm scabbing onto the old transformer, I'll power up the boards. Get the comm line on. I'll get everything online. I'll get everything programmed, like the base program. I never, ever do inputs and outputs until I'm doing the switchover. I'll have it laid out in my head. I never pre-do the inputs and outputs. I do do it while I'm doing it. Do you have both EMS systems running at the same time, one to monitor the the cases and the other one to... Do a monitor the rack? Or are you doing this all one shot? One, you know. So I I did it one shot for a couple of years. It stressed mm-hmm. me the fuck out. It was a time time crunch always. I do it with mm-hmm. the rack running. So I start with the compressors and work my way to the cases, mm-hmm. and then once I'm on the cases, mm-hmm. my partner's doing the condenser. So usually, usually I'll do one, uh, like, you know, let's just say we have five controllers, um, you know, first day, first day, like you said, set up, make sure you have everything, um, you know, after you plan everything out, um, basically start programming the, the newer controllers that you're putting in for the swap over. Like, so we were going from Comtrol to Danfoss, which, you know, is fairly easy because it's, you know, you basically print out your, uh, your, your grid list from, from easy set where it basically gives you all your inputs and outputs. And then after that, it's basically reprogramming the controller. And that's what we would do. Basically throw that on the, on that, on the rack, uh, let it run while we're programming the other controllers and basically, you know, finding glitches as the, as the new one comes online. And then for the night, we'll switch it back over to control and let it run, you know, run, let it run off there. No, no, I just, I just go full send. It's, uh, I, I, as, as I'm, as I'm running it, it, or as it's getting set up, it's, it's, it's running. I try to do a rack a day, and then commission the next day. So like okay. I'll, we, we've got it down. Like I have two different partners that I work with all the time. Like I have a pretty good system with them. So mm-hmm. I generally would do the wiring, and then mm-hmm. I'll call out outputs and inputs. So the reason I don't pre-do outputs and inputs is it slows you down and creates stress. If you're trying to put an output, okay, it's got to go to output four. Like that's where it was in the old board. Mm-hmm. Well, shit, now the wire doesn't reach. It's three inches short. Okay. I either pull a new wire because I refuse to splice. So I either pull a new wire down to the terminal block. If it's, if it's quick and easy, I pull a new wire. I, I have spool 16 gauge with me. If it's not, it's going to a different output on a different board. Gotcha. Well, so that's why I'll call them out. Like uh, we may move compressor number four to board train number two. It, it, it really just depends. Whatever is easiest and keeps it moving the fastest. You know, I, I redo the IO schedules in the, in the end, but whatever keeps it moving the fastest and looks the best Nobody's going to complain about it. I always remake my IO schedules later.
That's one thing about microthermal that I love the new, especially the new version. You could print the IO schedules right off the boards. Really? Really? Yeah. Everything's done for you. Inputs, outputs, board markings, everything. So, so I'll just the- I'll save them on a flash drive, take them home, print them and laminate them. And then I put them in a rack. So the programs are because the program's already in the board, you can then access the program and it'll download whatever is connected that you have programmed on a sheet that you can print out. Yes. It's already in an IO sheet. So like oh. it's already like in in a PDF. Okay. So like you just gotta save the PDF. Gotcha. gotcha. So you could pre-program it and then print out the PDF. Mm-hmm. And then you could <clears throat> that's your that's your pop sheet. Gotcha. See, with CPC, it's a little more difficult. What I'll end up doing is I have been taking the screenshots of Ultrasight, of the inputs and outputs. That's how I've been doing my that. Or I put them in Excel. It it really just depends. There's no way to import it, is there? There is not. That sucks. Dan Foss, can you do it on Dan Foss? I, I I don't know. I don't know. That's a Yoder question. <laughs> RDM, I think, I think you can in RDM because I've seen I've seen printouts of boards in RDM. Yeah. So but, yeah, probably RDM, Comtrol. Um, Comtrol, I know you can print. Yeah, because that's what I used to do because I'm old. Um, yeah, that's what well, I used to use. R- use these so if I'm doing an RMCC to E2 conversion, like mm-hmm. generally what I'll do like I love doing these because they're they're butter. Mm-hmm. I will back up the RMCC. I will print the set point file and save it to a PDF. And then I will have Ultrasight open and I will program my inputs and outputs and all my stuff in the E2 with the the printed out PDF on half my screen. So that way I'm just transferring over data. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll do that. Now, having that backup's key, and I will say this, having a ton of labels and label maker is key also. You don't want to get ahead of yourself and pull too many wires off, and you don't know where these wires went. I've been pretty diligent about marking my wires lately and uh, making sure everything's marked to make it as easy to troubleshoot as possible. And then generally, I will make a new wiring diagram if I have to. And I've been using this program called Easy I uh, Easy I O mm-hmm. to do my uh, my wiring diagrams. It's uh it's worked out pretty well. It's this isn't free program. It's a they, or I'm sorry, it's Tiny CAD. Tiny CAD is the uh, the program. It's kind of, it's it's cheap. I mean, it, it's free. It's kind of like a cheaper, like crappier CAD, but I mean, it's it's free. You said it's and it works. Tiny CAD. Tiny- Tiny CAD, like you can make your own symbols in it and stuff. Like I made my own uh, like uh, IDCM modules. I made my own demand cooling modules. I'll make my own compressor stuff, like bits or modules, and then I can make out a wiring diagram and uh, put everything in there. But for a free CAD, the like tiny like CAD software, it's not terrible. It does what I need to do, and then you could print it off as a PDF and uh, have it like a nice legend in there. It it, it works. I don't have a fancy CAD software. Oh, no. I, I think I'm going to download this. It, it works really well for doing wiring diagrams. Well, I, I've seen one or two diagrams that you've done off of it, and I've just never asked you where, <laughs> how you put it together. I mean, the last the, the I mean, the last couple I did for that last that Costco I did turned out, like, mm-hmm. really nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just making sure I got the wiring diagrams for that, but, like, I generally try to control – who is doing a switch over? Like if the the person doing the layout needs to be doing the wiring and have the other person doing something else, don't try to do two at the same time. But that way the person doing the layout knows that all the wiring is right and where the wiring needs to go and everything else. So I generally will lay out everything and I will do the wiring and I will have my second guy finish the programming and or Call. I'll be calling out board points for him to land in the controller. And then once we get to that point, we start the verification. So, like, once I finish the compressors, 
and get the suction group done or that that done, I'm moving on to circuits, and that second guy is testing compressors while I'm moving on to circuits and doing that. So we're constantly working together, we're working off each other, and we're like verifying what what's what the other one's done. So if I do all the if I do all the compressor wiring, he's going to verify operation afterwards. So that way, both of us are verifying it, and we're both on the hook if I fucked it up. You never screw up, though. That's not true. I screw up all the time. I was better at hiding it. True. I mean, I'm not going to say it. So any <laughs> any tools that you recommend? Um, I have a couple. M12 Impact, killer. Like, use the shit out of it. Klein, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, God. They both make one. Klein, Klein makes yeah. one. What is that German company that makes those like kick ass tools? Uh, the red and black. I, know, I don't know. Uh, there are these scissors. Uh, it's not Wes, it's uh, Wahala or something. I, uh, but I will tell you this electrician scissors. Like, I use scissors more than any any tool in my bag. I yeah. don't use wire strip wire. I use I use electrician scissors. Like these, uh, these will cut like four gauge wire. Four gauge. Like, and there's, yes. Like I don't believe it. right now, they're sharp as shit. Yeah. I, I've almost cut the tip of my finger off with them. So the scissors are the biggest one. Uh, Klein makes an eighth inch, six inch long, and an eight inch long control screwdriver. Use the eight inch long one all the time. Do you like the wire stripper that pulls off the, the pulls the the shielding off the cable? No, I don't use that. I use the scissors. So with the scissors, when you if, once you get a feel for it, you know you could just barely uh, slice the outside of it, and you pull the whole thing off. Shield it that you pull the shielding. You cut the uh, um, the outside jacketing. Like once you get a feel for it, you get real good at it. Like I'm good at it. Like I, I can do it without nicking the wire. It'll also cut that stupid ass white string that never wants to cut. So if anyone actually doesn't know that white string's meant to be able to pull the shielding down off of the off of the cabling. Um so and if you expose huh? And it cuts the jacket too. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. So the, the basically the wire cuts through the jacketing on the outside, so it pulls everything down. So you have all the wires there and you didn't you're just cutting it. So because I mean you don't wanna you don't wanna end up actually cutting into the wire anyway, right? Allegedly. Allegedly. Unless you want to have some like some ghost uh, problems for uh, service later on. <sighs> you're horrible. So that and then a zip tie gun. Use the zip tie gun like nonstop, which I never had one of these until I saw somebody else with it. I love that thing. So what it, it's it's a zip tie tensioning gun. They're like 25 bucks on Amazon. It cuts the zip ties off clean, not jagged, not sharp, clean, and right at the uh, the tensioner. So and it'll also tension them for you. So you get the, just the right amount of tension and where it's not going to break the zip tie, and then it cuts it off clean so you're not cutting people later on. Yeah, I, I use my uh, the, my duct one for that. It does like the big 24, 36 inch zip ties. Use that on a bundle yeah, of like five wires. Important. That one's hard to get in, uh, like certain type type places. And then another thing, a laser, laser level. Really? So, yeah, we use it a lot for for, for panel layouts, panel oh, layouts. Okay. So, okay, like, what that. we'll do is we'll we'll set the level, like especially if we're doing din rail stuff. We'll set the level, knock the din rail out real quick, or like if we're doing a bunch of panel uh, board layouts. Like if I'm doing CPC boards, instead of sitting there with a level and a tape measure, we'll set the first one, get the level on, and then say if we got to set like five more boards, it's just boom, 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 all in a row. We no don't got to worry about anything. What's up? Do you have a lot of caffeine today? Because you're you're acting super Brett today, like very just no. off, just I'm exhausted. Yeah, I was just curious. I didn't know if you you had a boatload of caffeine before you got. <laughs> You're a dick. <laughs> That's a legitimate question. Just I so I, you just you know rattling shit off. <laughs> Are you squeezing a squishy toy? Yeah. Is this stress ball? Yeah, thinking it's your head right now. That's all right. 
It happens. Oh my god, relentless. Yeah, my my I, I had fifty two phone calls by uh by five oh. PM yesterday. <laughs> Summer's here. All right, guys, thanks for listening. All right, guys, have a good night. Well, they say all good things come to an end. What's that got to do with this show? <laughs> <laughs>